Hello? Hello? Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, Sunil. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Good. Yes. Uh, so, let, yeah. let me know when we are good to go. Yeah, okay. We, okay. Satish, can we go to that? Uh, ah, okay, okay. One second, sir, I will be coming back to you soon. Hello, Arul. Hi. Hi. Yeah, that, I think there is a Zoom in here. So there is a camera. <laughs> camera. Yes. Sorry, yes. Sorry yes. Arul, I, am, uh, I have to join only online. Yeah, so yeah, camera no is there. Uh, yes, problem. but it is wonderful to have you here for this talk. Yeah. Fantastic to be here. Yes. So it's about time, Sunil. So yeah, yeah, that's fine. Is it on? Oh, the slide is very nicely visible. Yeah. Sunil, is it time to go? Yeah, yeah. Am I audible, Sunil? Arvinda? Uh, yeah, hello, sir. Uh, Arvinda will introduce. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah, before that, uh, we, the, the, the students are still coming. Maybe in two minutes we will start. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, so let me know when we are good to go. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think uh, now it's a time. Okay, two minutes, five, two or three, no, yeah. Anything from me? Slide is not changing? Yeah, yeah. So maybe somebody can change here, right? So maybe, by it's like, but let's get it, uh, uh, another one here, okay. So, I mean, yeah, I think 
because quantum mechanics. So a unitary operator, a Hermitian operator. Uh, to quantum mechanics. Yeah. Okay. Can Can we start? Sure. Let's start. No, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, it's moving. Sure. For Sunil, yeah. there's been a request from the students that I should introduce my campus. Sunil? <laughs> okay. So, okay. Is that part of the board? Is that something? Okay. Uh, that will be too low. Yeah, we can switch on the we? lights if you want. Uh, uh, we we yeah, can switch lights, on the lights. lights yeah. I think to begin with, let light. Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. see. Keep the lights. We'll keep the oh. line. We'll control it now. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Apply it. Okay. 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 The study is done. Okay. Okay. Shall we start? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Okay, sir. Sir, I think now we can start. Okay. So Thank you. Can, you. Yeah. Please. Thank you very much, Sunil, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. A very hearty welcome to Professor Arul Lakshminarayan. It's such a great pleasure and a privilege to have you here, Arul. Uh, I'm sorry I'm able to join only online, but uh, I'm, I'm really very happy to host today's seminar. Uh, the Center for Atomic Molecular Optical Sciences and Technologies is jointly hosted by IIT Tirupati as well as ISR Tirupati. So we plan that some of the in-person seminars will be on the IIT campus and some at the ISR campus. So today's seminar is at the ISR campus. We are very happy to have this. And I'm sure um, everybody's looking forward to the seminar because uh, it is going to deal with some very exciting problems. Uh, we know that quantum entanglement does uh, wonders and uh, Arul and uh, his collaborators, uh, one of them is with here today, Arvinda. Uh, they have uh, worked on some problems, uh, obtaining solutions to pro very old problems, like almost 250 years old problem, Euler's uh, officer's problem. And uh, let me invite Dr. Arvinda to please introduce Professor Arul Lakshmi Narayan. Arvinda? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to in, uh, introduce uh, Professor Arul Lakshmi Narayan. Uh, Arul, uh, Arul Lakshmi Narayan is a theoretical physicist with research interest in quantum chaos, quantum information, many body systems, and random matrix theory. He obtained his PhD at SUNY uh, uh, in New York, followed by postdoctoral work at uh, PRL, Physics Research Laboratory, where he subsequently became a faculty member. He was awarded the INSA Young Scientist Award for Theoretical Physics. Since 2003, he has been at IIT Madras. He has held long-term visiting positions at the Washington State University, uh, Pullman, IIT Kanpur, TU Dresden, and uh, the Max Planck Institute for Phys Physics of Complex Systems, Dresden, Germany. So I welcome you, Arun, for the talk. Thank you all very much. Am I audible? Is this? I'll, I'll put it on. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Yeah. Is this better? Is this better for all of you? Yeah? I think it's better. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'm used to show, I'm, I'm I'm used to a large classroom, so hopefully my voice carries. But please let me know if it's not. Yeah. So. Uh, hello, sir. Can you hear uh, Professor Arul? Yeah, on the Zoom uh, he is audible. On the Zoom channel, I have no difficulty hearing. Okay. Okay. okay good. Yeah. Okay. So how about uh, the backside? Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. In case it's you know fading away, please let me know. So thank you all very much. Uh, and begin by thanking uh, Professor P.C. Deshmukh uh, 
Pranoy or PCD, as he is known as uh, from IIT Madras, he has actually taught taught us. So I mean, he's been uh, it's kind of embarrassing. After I joined as a, a faculty member, he said he found answer sheets, and uh, so <laughs> so uh, yeah. So it, it's a it's a great honor and pleasure that uh, uh, Pranoy is here and. Uh, he has uh, uh, been instrumental in uh, starting this uh, um, center. And uh, there are so many active uh, people in the center. And it's my first visit to this ISER uh, and IIT Tirupati. And it's uh, really impressive that uh, there are two institutes which are growing up together. And uh, I have not actually seen this before in India. Or anywhere else for that matter. So I think it's a great beginning, and it's been really embarrassing that there is such nice, uh, you know, such great uh, host here. And I am um, uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, I've been invited. So thanks, Arvinda. Thanks, Ritesh. And thanks to all the members. Uh, thanks to Sunil for organizing this and uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, I did put this title in because it encompasses some objects which have been interesting me for the last several years. But I got a request from students here, and you know, the majority of you are students, and I was told that some words there do not make sense. Words like unitary doesn't make sense. So. Uh, I think I need to switch back a little bit, uh, but maybe uh, I, I do have a slide there which says what a unitary is, but maybe I'll have a five minute, uh, you know, a kind of an introduction uh, which will which will address uh, those of you who have no quantum mechanics or have just started on quantum mechanics, those are very young uh, in the in the audience. So here is my five minute introduction or attempt at an introduction. Not possible, of course. That's why I attempted. Um, so quantum mechanics began out of a necessity to understand experiments. Try as hard as one might, there were several experiments which just did not fit the data. There was the famous black body radiation problem. There's a spectrum which is coming out of that, just couldn't be explained. With that. And then there were several experiments uh, which, were, uh, which were popping up, including the spectrum of atom, which appeared to be discrete sets. Light was coming out, not in all frequencies or wavelengths, but only very definite uh, things. So this seemed very surprising. and. Uh, about 100 years ago, in fact, uh, 1900, uh, it's Planck, 1905, Einstein, and then the major developments happened in 1913, 1904, Niels Bohr. Uh, it was a fantastic period for physics. Uh, then there was the 1920s, there was major experiments such as the stern galak experiment, uh, and then the works of Erwin Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and I believe Heisenberg, I, I, I could be wrong, but when, when he, he realized that here was certain mathematics which seemed important to develop this, and then somebody told him what you're doing is matrix multiplication. So nowadays we study matrix multiplication in uh, probably high school or something, but you must understand that that is the context. The, these were not standard objects in physics. So Heisenberg developed his version of quantum mechanics. You'll see Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger picture of quantum mechanics. But it's not two political parties. They came together in a brilliant synthesis by a English physicist called Paul Dirac, very young person and uh, at that time, of course. And then he, in his thesis, pointed out that both these pictures of quantum mechanics were the same. 
Uh, and so the, uh, there is only one quantum mechanics, but there are so many interpretations of quantum mechanics. And this, these interpretations come about because of a certain process in quantum mechanics, which is different from classical called measurement. So there is evolution like you know, Newton's laws. Everyone here would be familiar with Newton's laws, which is telling you how a state evolves in a classical system. A state in a quantum system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Now, the Schrodinger equation is a particular type of evolution of a state. So think about a state as an abstract thing, like in classical mechanics as position and momentum. In quantum mechanics, you, position and momentum cannot be measured at the same time. So that is the essence of the uncertainty principle. Uh, one of the consequences of the uncertainty principle. So the, one of the basic structures of classical mechanics, the phase space, went away, or at least could not be directly used. There is no phase space in quantum mechanics. Instead, it was replaced by an even more abstract space of space of states, which you can just think about as a vector space as kind of a generalization of our usual X, Y, Z space of vectors that we study, but it's a more abstract vector space. And if you're more mathematician, and in fact, Hilbert plays a way, played a very important role in the development of quantum mechanics, the mathematician Hilbert, so it's called a Hilbert space, which is basically a space of states in which you can measure the distance between states. Okay. Uh, and these states are evolving. And these states are evolving in quantum mechanics according to Schrodinger's equation. And they are evolving in a particular way, which is called unitary. So unitary matrices or unitary operators to be more um, you know, erudite about it, are the objects which carry one quantum state to another, evolve in time. So this, these form then very central objects in quantum mechanics, these unitary operators. Um, exactly why they are called unitary, they keep together things in the sense of there is no escape from, there is no escape or there is no dissipation. There is that kind of a thing. You could think about classical mechanics. Those of you who have done classical mechanics to some extent would be familiar with things like canonical transformation, right? Canonical transformation. The equivalent of canonical transformations in quantum mechanics are unitary transformation. And so these are the principal uh, way in which states evolve in space. Uh, so, so maybe as an equation, a unitary operator, I'll write as a U. Uh, yeah, maybe we can then bring it back. Uh, okay, that, that works. That should be fine. Thanks. Yeah. So in quantum mechanics, for some reason, everything is Greek and Greek, not even Latin, right? So states are written. You may think about states as something written like this, which you may you may just think about as a vector. For those of you who are not familiar with this notation, as a vector, just think about a vector, meaning think about a column vector okay, with entries into these. What are these entries? These entries are, you, you, must have studied, you must have heard about wave functions, those of you who have not studied quantum mechanics again. So wave functions have definite values at some given position x. So you may think about these entries as corresponding to these values. Okay. Except that, here there is an uncountable infinity of values and this vector looks very complicated. That's why we don't write the state generally as a vector. But you may think of a situation where there's only two positions possible. It's not that abstract actually. There's two positions possible and you have only a two dimensional vector, right? So you may think about this as essentially this and a unitary operator 
or a unitary matrix multiplying this vector. You're all familiar with what happens when a matrix multiplies a vector. You get another vector. So you get another state out of this, say phi prime. Okay. And this unitary operator, I mean, this operator u is unitary if the length of this vector remains unchanged. If the length of this vector phi and phi prime remains unchanged, then this u is unitary. So, in terms of a matrix, you all know what uh, a, a transpose of a matrix is, right? What does a transpose of a matrix do? If I can expect some response from second year students alone. Very good. There's an interchange of row and column. So it's just a reflection about the diagonal, right? And you all know what a complex conjugate is of a complex number. So the entries of a unitary matrix in general complex. So you take complex conjugate and transpose of this. You call this object an adjoint. And an op matrix U is unitary if this a joint is its inverse. Inverse is the same as a joint. So then this ensures that this length of this vector is preserved. That's why it's unitary. Okay. So you can try to, those of you who haven't tried, can go back and try to construct a unitary matrix, two by two sufficient as an exercise. Okay. So they play a very important role in quantum mechanics and general physics because all time evolution is described by unitary operators. Right? Um, now I said that quantum mechanics, there's only one quantum mechanics, many interpretations. That's coming because of a certain aspect of quantum mechanics called measurements, which of course we have to do. Uh, experimentalist is ha necessarily has to uh, get some information out of these states. And that comes about when you make a measurement. But actually, my talk doesn't go that much into measurement, so I'm not going to go into, into that. So any quick questions? No? All right. Um, So let me tell you one more aspect of a state, which is kind of strange in quantum mechanics, okay? And that has to do with entanglement, which is kind of part, part of my talk here. Now, yesterday we had a great uh, landing, soft landing of the uh, Chandrayaan on the moon, a fantastic uh, achievement. It's all classical mechanics, right? I mean, it's uh, it's fantastic uh, orbits which are then going. There are these celestial mechanics complicated, but we can control everything, and it's actually we are able to uh, uh, do that. Why is that possible? How is that possible in classical mechanics? In classical mechanics, if you are given the state of two particles like the moon and the earth. They're not particles exactly, but we are all particles on the particle, right? So there is, uh, let's say the moon and then the, the sun, not according to scale. And uh, there is position and momentum of the earth, position momentum of the moon. That is the state of the earth. There is uh, the position of the earth X, momentum of the earth, very simplified. Position of the moon, momentum of the moon. classical. Now, suppose you are given this state of the moon and the earth together. That means you are given the position of the moon, position of what the momentum of the moon, position of the earth, momentum of the earth. And somebody were to ask you, hey, do you know what the moon is doing now? What will you say? Where is it? Where is the moon? 
XM, right? XM is the position of the moon. You know the position of the moon. Given the moon and the Earth position and momentum, you know the position and momentum of the moon or of the Earth. This seems an obvious fact, nothing to belabor about. However, quantum mechanics, that's not the case. If you're given the state of the Earth and moon together, let us call this EM. This is a state of Earth and moon together because they are interacting. There is gravitational pull. So there is a state which is describing both the Earth and moon together, a quantum state. And then you ask, what is the state of the moon? Actually, there is no answer to this question. Or what is the state of the Earth? There is no direct answer to this question. There are only partial answers to this question in the sense that it can tell you what happens if you make measurements on the stay on the moon, so to speak, on that particle, the moon particle or the earth particle. You can say something about probabilities. This is one of the key differences between classical and quantum mechanics, that quantum mechanics is intrinsically probabilistic, stochastic. Whereas classical mechanics is not, it's deterministic. Even though there is chaos and so on, it is still completely deterministic. In quantum mechanics, it's a linear theory. However, it's completely probabilistic, intrinsically probabilistic. In fact, quantum random number generators, which is today a technology to produce genuine quantum numbers, comes from this quantum, is making use of this basic uncertainty coming from quantum measurements. And I believe uh, there is there are now cell phones which use quantum random number generators. So to generate random numbers is a very key task which we do, all, like some random OTP is generated and things like that. So, but coming back to this, this is called entanglement. If the state of a joint system is such that the whole is in a definite state, so let, this may sound a bit mystical. Whole is in a definite state, but the parts are not. I'm actually quoting this from Erwin Schrodinger, who not only developed quantum mechanics, but was very quick to see all the major differences and quirks of quantum mechanics. So, in a mathematical sense, a state is called entangled. A state is called entangled if it cannot be written as a state of the Earth, state of the moon. You may think about this as the state of the Earth, state of the moon put together. If it cannot be written, it's called entangled. And entanglement was realized, I mean, from early on in quantum mechanics, as I said, Schrodinger. But since 1990s, it, has be, it is being seen as a resource for various interesting operations. So in quantum information, actually, there was, I think, a talk by Professor Arunpati here. So for those of you who attended, he might have introduced some of these aspects. So there, are, there, is, a, there, is, an, there is a thing called teleportation which sounds like a cool thing, but it's actually a pretty important quantum information task where entanglement is used to do something which you cannot do classically. Similarly to, you know, there are, uh, there are many, uh, there are some things called dense coding, cryptography. So in terms of applications, entanglement is, uh, is, has been increasingly used. And you may ask why, you know, 1930s entanglement was appreciated. Why are we about nearly 100 years later as something very important? Is that experimentally very difficult to keep entanglement alive when you have separated particles? And that is what we are doing now in, in, in experiments are achieving this kind of thing. So the Nobel Prize last year to uh, uh, three people who are instrumental in experimentally testing the consequences, one of the major consequences of this entanglement is non-locality. 
quantum mechanics is different basically from quantum mechanics in viewing things as a whole. And if you make some measurements in a part, it can affect or the, a distant part and create correlations between them, which is not easy to detect, which is not like any classical correlation. So entanglement creates these kind of correlations. So the Bell inequalities, which was developed by John Bell in the 1960s, were increasingly tested in experiments where there was entanglement between special photons, which were increasingly separated initially by meters and then several hundred meters and actually kilometers. And now there is between satellite and ground, there is sharing of entanglement in these things. So this is where uh, I think it's an exciting uh, prospect. Otherwise, entanglement is responsible for chemical bonding and so on and so forth. It's not, it's not something which is, uh, uh, but what is, what is difficult is to keep this entanglement in macroscopically separated particles. Okay, so that's my, now you know what my five minutes is, it's about half an hour. So is there any quick, second year students, is quantum mechanics entanglement all perfectly clear to you? May I proceed to my talk? Yes. <clears throat> so I wanted to ask, it's if, like the in the ERP paradox, like uh, the an electron decays and like the two particles, they're placed. Uh, if you place them. Uh, across like you across the universe uh, measurement will like uh, what i understood was if one of the particle has spin up that would influence the other particle like i quite didn't understand that uh, elaborate on it more you're in you're in good company if you did not understand. so but what she is asking is that you know what what seems paradoxical that spins well separated and you make change or a measurement on one of it instantly changes the entire state so that looks like action at a distance which we know cannot happen there is no action at a distance but in fact quantum mechanics is perfectly consistent with no action at a distance and actually although the global state is changing but this change cannot be transmitted in terms of information this is the main thing. The other person is equally clueless whether that person has made this change or not. So this information is not transmitted. For you to transmit that, although it is non-local, so the state is non-locally changing. So that's where the, the key thing is and whether quantum mechanics is non-local or not and so on, this foundation questions, Professor Arvinda can probably talk about this at some stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on. Uh, so I actually have two questions. Yeah. So um, first question is that you told like quan uh, quantum mechanics is all about probability, but I have heard that in time evolved Schrodinger equation, if you have the state at a particular time t, you can tell about the states after it. Like at a particular time, you can you can state that what uh, in what condition that particle will be. So how can you tell it? It's it is probabilistic. Uh. If I understand you correctly, you said that if you know the state at one time, you can tell you can what tell the state is later. Another time, yeah. Absolutely. So how it could it be probabilistic if you can tell good it? Good question, yeah. This is my first question. So in fact, <laughs> good. So in fact, what I wrote here is completely deterministic, right? There is a state phi, and after some time, maybe I'll put the time as some argument of this thing here. After some time t, it is the state. In fact, let me put time zero. Time t. Perfectly deterministic. You're absolutely correct. Schrodinger equation is a deterministic equation. The probability comes in measurement. When you make a measurement of a state, there are various possibilities. And those possibilities are not controlled by you. There are probabilities. In the, in the, it's like a coin toss, but not at all like a coin toss. It's like a coin toss in the sense that 
the outcomes are probabilistic but direct so measurement is where the probability enters yeah um, thank you sir and my second question is like um in i have heard that in quantum mechanics we talk about imaginary time okay so from that can we conclude no not me but maybe there are others <laughs> Okay, so um, can I say that there is Im imaginary dimensions, like imaginary length and imaginary dimensions or something like that? No, if, actually. And if there is, so yeah. can there be like negative dimensions? No, no, wait. Quantum mechanics is weird, but not that weird. Okay. Uh, first of all, there is no imaginary time. Imaginary numbers play an important role in quantum mechanics. Complex numbers play an important role in quantum mechanics. So let me write down the Schrodinger equation. I square root of minus one, imaginary. H bar, Planck's constant. Derivative with respect to time of a state psi is some operator or matrix H multiplying that state psi. Okay, this is Schrodinger equation. And sh such a simple, beautiful equation. Schrodinger slept on the equation for one year because he was worried about the I till he was convinced that this is it. Nothing can, there's no negotiation. You can't write a proper equation, real court equation, but this has nothing to do with the time is still real. Okay. The states are complex. These states are complex, these vectors, but not time. Thank you, sir. Thanks. All right, so let's, move. yeah, there's one more. Arul, um, if I may, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. Yes, please, Pranav. Um, but I, I think it, it's wonderful that we are having so many questions, but- This is the only time it, I'm going to have questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my, my worry is that uh, we will lose a lot of time on this. So, so maybe what may we... I suggest that we have the questions after your talk and you move sure. on to the talk? Yeah. So, and we can, you know, discuss that. Yes. And then I think they, the students will continue to have questions and maybe Sunil, Arvinda, right. Sambuddha can uh, address them uh, in due course of time. Thanks for the intervention, Pranav. Otherwise, this is yeah. not going to... Yeah. Work. Sorry, because this would not... Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, good. Yes. So, uh, so, let me go on to tell you about uh, this work, which is is done with a bunch of people over several years. Uh, this is a student of mine, PhD student, who is now a postdoc at Max Planck for Complex Systems in Dresden. Arvinda, you know here, he is a, a faculty at IIT Tirupati. Ramdas is doing his postdoc with me. Uh, Vijay uh, Kodialam is a mathematics uh, professor at uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Adam. Wojtek, Brusda, Gregorsh, uh, they're all ex-students of Karol Shishkowski from the university, Jagiellonian University, one of the ancient universities in Krakow, Poland. So I've had the pleasure of, uh, you know, talking to all of them. Doesn't seem to be, no. Okay, good. Thanks. So I talked about the moon earth state now, but we know that moon and earth are not alone. You have so many planets and generally many body systems are there everywhere. Collection of electrons, atoms, and they're all interacting. This is actually quite a difficult problem. And a lot of time has been spent in science to describe approximate methods, uh, and numerical methods and so on. It's actually a difficult problem in general. And uh, uh, what our large goal is, larger goal is, is try to find minimal models which describe the essence of these many body problems. And what are the essence? So one of the essence is unitarity. I just described unitary operators and so on. So in fact, unitary, that is the evolution has to be unitary to keep to the risk of quantum mechanics as isolated quantum systems. Locality means that interactions are not happening between very widely separated particles. 
Okay, so no Zoom calls between particles. All right, so it's all local. So that's what this is. And in fact, such like uh, systems have, are now being built and controlled, as I said, in experiments. Here is an example of uh, this, uh, this experiment done by uh, Google some time ago, maybe 2019, uh, where you're seeing these squares here. These are all single particle unitary operators. So there's quantum mechanics going on. If I write square root of W, that's a particular unitary operator, okay? There is a state which is putting in here, let's call it zero, initial state. Don't think about it as zero as a number, some initial state. And then there is this, uh, uh, there, there is this operator that acts on it, okay? So similarly here. And then there is another unitary that acts on it. You may think of this x-axis as time. And these things which are joining these uh, unitaries, this, these bars here, these bridges, they are actually interactions, okay? So they are, so you may think of each of these things as a, a quantum bit or a qubit that is zero or one. So you can think about this as a quantum bit uh, where superpositions between zero and one are possible. So what happens is it's put through this unitary machine with these interactions and these unitary operators. And what comes out of this is your final state. And this may seem like a pretty trivial thing, but as a matter of fact, if you want to do such a computation with let's say 50 particles, phi zero, that's it. You need a resource of two power 50. You need to deal with matrices of the order which is exponential in the number of particles. So two is the smallest uh, number of states you can have in a quantum system, like a two level atom. And therefore this requires two power 50, that's too much. And that's why quantum computation is uh, a promising thing because it says, well, even though you are, uh, the, num the uh, amount of resources which you need are exponential in the number of particles, if you actually do quantum mechanics, you can let nature do the computation for you. So this is what this experiment uh, tried to do. And it measured the outcome of this. And as I said, it's probabilistic when you make measurements. And therefore you get a probability distribution out of this. And uh, each time you make this measurement, you get some outcome and you get a probability distribution of the outcome. That probability distribution is, for those of you who know a chi-square distribution is like a chi-square distribution, like a square of a Gaussian distribution. Okay. And uh, this experiment tested whether this was correct. If you do this classically, as I said, it's not possible because it requires this two power 50 state to be stored on a computer and to be manipulated. These kind of matrices are not possible to, this, these dimensions are not possible to, uh, uh, to do. On your laptop, maybe you can do 10,000 at the most if you're willing to wait a lot, 10,000 dimensional uh, dimensions, right? So that's like uh, two power 20 is a million. So think about it, 50, not possible. So, uh, so they, they claimed that they were able to do something which was not possible classically. And by the way, this kind of a thing is called a unitary circuit because you have put, put unitary operators in a circuit, you have joined them like you're joining resistances and so on. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, that's what a unitary operator is. Uh, a unitary circuit. Okay. Uh, I'm again having problems going forward. Huh? Just between these two operators. So actually it is in a 2D configuration, like what you're seeing here. So, uh, so the qubits are here. Uh, no, I, I think the, yeah. So these are the gates. Yeah, so these are the gates and they are being connected locally. Yeah, they can be spatially separated or no? Not really, like this one which appears to be non-local right. is actually these two. Right, but that is allowed. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. but it's not long range in ah, that. Got it, got it. Yeah. yeah, thanks. 
yeah so these kind of circuits random quantum circuits have been used by theorists to study uh, uh, these many body systems to analytically derive quantities like how this entanglement which i mentioned how they grow with time if you don't have initially entanglement but you have interactions they can grow with time and how some information which is localized somewhere gets scrambled and is spread all over so if information is spread all over it will be difficult to retrieve that information uh, so here are some other experiments which talk about this kind of a uh, thing so here is a, a many particle system uh, where there is uh, this is this is in this pure state psi and then there is unitary dynamics which is taking you to a more complex state and we are interested in knowing how this uh, small part of this complex state whether it looks like some thermal state has been reached some thermalization has been so this is an experiment which uh, seek to do that uh, in in a in a many body uh, system because entanglement is also driving this kind of thermalization in isolated quantum systems so what happens to these states so a state can look as simple as this if you just think about spins as having up and down so here are up down and so on and here you can entangle two of them let's say the, these two up and down spins into a singlet and then let the state evolve so this entanglement spreads and uh, also because of the dynamics new entanglement is coming in it's not just that this spreads and this many body system gets typically entangled but as i said you have to think about this state as a whole it's not possible to think of this as if this is entangled with this or this is entangled with this this entire bunch is entangled so this is called multipartite entanglement and i would encourage you to think about this entanglement via this picture which is a picture of what's called a boromian ring there are three rings here in which no two are linked to each other but actually all three are linked to each other in the sense that all three are inseparable but any two are separable you see if you look at the green and the blue the green is entirely into the in, inside the blue they are not linked at all but actually all three are linked these are called boromian uh, rings but you will find this everywhere ah this is now working great so uh so here is an entangled state of uh, two qubits so now for those of you who aren't familiar just think about qubits as zero and one states of zero and one so this is two qubits in which both the qubits are in a state zero both are in a state one so this is an example of an entangled state you cannot write this as an state of qubit one into a state of qubit two here is an entangled state of three qubits So this is known as the bell state this is a ghz state and the th three qubit ghz state is given by this superposition here and there is a lot of difference between how entanglement is shared in this ghz state and this w state although they look very similar they are not in terms of entanglement content they are very different and in fact this ghz state is a bit like this boromian rings in the sense that no two particles are entangled with each other but all three are entangled together whereas w state is not like what about higher number of qubits so four qubit states actually if you try to just naively generalize like this and you write a four qubit ghz state is it a state which is highly entangled we are interested in generating highly entangled multipartite states and in fact this question is negatively answered and you can also generalize this w state but with all possible permutation but even this is not is not maximally entangled okay so in fact for four qubit states and higher number of qubits characterizing multipartite entanglement remains a challenge and that's part of our work uh, which tries to do that okay this i have already mentioned that you should think about entanglement being shared globally rather than locally okay 
So this I have already told you, start with operators rather than states. I would like to start with operators rather than states though, although we are interested in states. Um, so as I told you, unitary operators are very important in quantum mechanics. They come from the evolution of states. So time evolution is the unitary operator. For example, for a free particle, you know that P square kinetic energy, e to the power of just kinetic energy into time t. And circuit models of quantum computations are example of many body unitary evolutions. Here is a circuit uh, where there are three qubits. Two of them are initialized in state zero. H is a, let me write it out immediately. Here is a two by two unitary matrix. So these are called gates now. So there's a Hadamard gate acting on this. And then there are these two qubit gates which are controlled not gates. So if this qubit is zero, then it does nothing to this qubit. If this qubit is one, then it changes that value of the other qubit from zero to one or one to zero. So this is a controlled not gate. And this is another controlled not gate, another Hadamard. And these are measurements, as I told you at the end of the day. So this is an example of a simple quantum circuit, which involves some unitaries, single qubit unitaries, two qubit unitaries and measurements. And this X and Z are these unitary operators called Pauli operators for those of you who don't know. And this circuit is a very simple circuit. In fact, it's a teleportation circuit. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned the word teleportation. This actually teleports the state psi from here to here. And the more you study this, I assure you, the less you will understand. So have fun with it. So, but what I want to emphasize is that there are these simple circuits which you can build out of these operators, which lead to very interesting results. And by the way, again, for especially for students, there is this quizkit.org. You can go there and implement these circuits on a quantum computer. Also simulate, can also use a real quantum computer of five qubits, it's available on the cloud. Okay, so now I come to what are dual unitary operators. Um, before that, uh, let me ask, Sunil, how much time should I plan for? Can I go for 15 minutes? 15 minutes is okay. Okay, so let me uh, let me then do the following. I'll I'll introduce you to uh, to this. I, I I already introduced you to the C naught gate, which is two inputs x and y. Okay, and two outputs x and x plus y. This x plus with a uh, with a circle on top is modulo uh, two. Okay. And X and Y can take values zero and one. That's it, qubits here. Yeah. Okay. So this looks like a classical uh, control not gate, but actually your inputs can be uh, superpositions of zero and one. And that's what creates the complications or the interesting things in quantum circuits. Okay. But otherwise the unitary gate. And I want to think about this in a kind of 90 degree rotated thing where I think about this inputs along this axis, X axis, and along the Y axis as time. So this X is the input, Y is the input into this, and the output after a time T is, after one time step is given by this. So here I've written more explicitly what happens to this target and uh, control. If the, tar if the control is zero, nothing happens to the target. If the control is one, the target is changed, okay? So that's the control not gate. And you can write this as a four by four matrix because there are four possibilities for the input, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So you can write this as a matrix. It's also a unitary matrix indeed. Now this control not gate is also a permutation matrix. It contains only a one and a zero. It contains only one, one along any column. Okay. so. In fact, this control not gate can be used along with the Hadamard gate to generate maximally entangled states, such as these bell states out of unentangled states. 
So these control not gates look kind of innocent, but actually they are the key uh, elements of a quantum circuit because they are the ones which are creating interactions and all the complexity in it. So when you look at a quantum computing circuit, how good a C0 gate is being implemented is the key to this. Uh, okay, so let me do let me uh, do the following kind of silly thing, where instead of the input here, I'm I'm going to look at it uh, sideways. The input I'm going to look at is as the control, and whatever I'm getting at the target is going to be my output. Okay, so I'm going to just rotate this by 90 degrees, essentially. That is, uh, I'm going to look at this element as being this, this element here where the input, so this is a new gate now, a blue gate is not C0 anymore. The input is these two control gates and the output is these two target zero, zero. So you see zero, zero goes to zero, zero. This is the other, possibility where zero one goes to zero one in the control not gate. But now the control bit is coming here. So zero zero goes to one one. You see now the problem. There are two control, there are two inputs, zero zero, which is going to two different outputs. This cannot be unitary. A unitary operator cannot have two inputs which are different and lead to the same uh, output. Okay, so, or, or in this case, the same input lead to different outputs. This is not physically, you have one particular input, you need a unique output out of that. Okay. So in fact, this blue gate is not unitary. And we can see that we can write it out in more full. And this is called a realignment operation. It's not a unitary operator. So you can take this matrix, this C0 matrix, and you can get that directly. You can get that directly by doing the following, split it into four two by two matrices, okay? And then take this matrix and make it a, this two by two matrix, the sub block, and make it into a, a row vector. I, I mean, the, the first column rather. So you'll get one, zero, zero, one. And then take the second one, zero, 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 third one, zero, 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 that thing. So in fact, that's how you get this. It's not unitary. So in fact, let us define a dual of a unitary to be something which remains unitary under this realignment operation. Huh? Then you call such a matrix a dual unitary operator. So a dual unitary is a subclass of unitary operator where you will do this particular operation where you're interchanging the, uh, uh, the, the, the input is essentially your, uh, the control input and output across time. So that's why this is called dual because it kind of changes the role of space and time. So this is space in this direction, time in this direction, okay? But if it remains unitary, then you call it dual unitary. A matrix is not, a matrix is just a collection of elements here. Yeah, it's a linear operator. The, the unitary dual matrix, uh, the just linear. Yeah. Like, like it's in, like any other matrix. Yeah. Like in, we represent it in bracket notation. So this also we can re represent it in a linear form, right? Like uh, like we used to do in normal matrices. Yeah. It's just, you just think about it as a normal matrix, only it's not unitary. And uh, sir, is Bell state somewhere, uh, somewhere related to Bell numbers? I don't know. No, not no. at all. No connection. There's no connection. There are different Bells also. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, let me introduce a new actor in this called the swap gate, uh, which uh, actually maybe I, do, I may not have the time to uh, go into the details, but let me introduce the swap gate here, which is just taking two inputs or this, this state here, phi one, phi two, and interchanges them. Okay, and, and that's just a swap gate. And the swap gate can be implemented by three C0 gates. So you can actually verify this already. So the swap gate is a very peculiar thing, which is highly non-local because it's interchanging two particles. 
but it creates no entanglement you see this is a, this has got no entanglement this is also got no anything that can be written as a product has no entanglement because you know the state of the parts not only the states of the whole so here is a swap operator written as a matrix it takes 0 0 to itself 0 1 to 1 0 1 0 to 0 1 1 1 to 1 okay here is a swap operator and now if you do this realignment operation which i told you split it into four uh, two by two blocks take this matrix pull it out you'll get again the same one zero 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 take this pull it out you'll get again zero zero one zero so in fact here the realignment is itself and the swap is a dual unitary operator okay uh, the swap multiplied by the c naught gate c naught is itself not a dual unitary as i said but swap is a dual unitary and swap multiplied by a C naught gate is actually a dual unitary operator in quantum computing. It's called a double C naught gate because it can be realized with just two C naughts. Okay. Uh, so again, a very simple matrix like this. And in fact, we can define a T dual operator or a gamma dual operator in the literature. It's called by both names. If a unitary U multiplied by the swap or swap multiplied by unitary U is dual, then you call such a U a dual unitary. Okay, so what we have learned so far is that there is something called unitary operators or unitary matrices. And there are two operations which you can do on them. One is this realignment R, other is this partial transpose of gamma. And if they remain unitary under each of these operations, they are interesting dual operators, dual unitary operators. So in fact, the C naught gate is an example of a dual operator. Okay, so I'll skip this mathematics maybe for the lack of time. But let me say that dual unitary operators, they maximize some operator entanglement. I, I mentioned about entanglement in states, but actually given an operator between two particles like the C naught operator, you can also measure how entangled these operators are. And they optimize, and these dual unitary oper operators are actually maximum operator entanglement. Okay, so the swap operator, for example, although it creates no entanglement, has maximum operator entanglement. <clears throat> So, um, so, uh, so can, this is an important question here. Can a unitary operator U be dual unitary as well as gamma unitary? So like we have encountered a C naught gate, which is actually gamma unitary, but it's not dual unitary. We have encountered a swap gate, which is dual unitary, but not gamma unitary. So are there such gates? They are called multi-unitary operators. And in fact, that is our essence of our work to show that there are such operators in dimensions which was not known before and what consequences they have for states. So Sunil has been kind to give me five more minutes. So I'll try to summarize that rather than go into the details of it. Those who are interested, I can, I'm, uh, I'm willing to uh, look at it to discuss it offline, but let me skip some of these things and go to this combinatorics, which I hope uh, uh, you will understand how to construct these dual unitary operators. <laughs> but before that, let me tell you that there exists no such dual, I'm sorry, these multi unitary operators. There exists no multi unitary operator four by four. That is, for two qubits, there exists no multi unitary operator. Okay? However, you need to go to higher dimensions, therefore, to get these multi unitary operators. And, uh, and uh, here is an example of that. Here is an example of that, which we construct from these Latin squares, which is a bit like your Sudoku puzzle. So here is a Latin square is a collection of numbers like D numbers. Here there is D is three, 
which is arranged in a d by d square or array. Here it is three by three, such that there is no repetition of a number along a row or column. That's it. So this is an example of a Latin square. Here is another example, different from this. Now you put them together. You put these two together, you will get this Latin. You'll you'll get this uh, thing, and these two Latin squares are said to be orthogonal to each other. If when you put them together, you get all possible nine pairs of numbers. You see, you get one one two two when you put them three three two three three one one two, etc. So you get all of these numbers. In which case you call this an orthogonal Latin square. Why is this an interesting thing? <laughs> because if we construct, so this is actually a permutation of nine elements. You may think about this as permutation of nine elements, one, one to three, three, among itself, to itself, to this set. So this is a permutation. You may write this state, a four uh, particle state from this. You can construct a four particle state from this in the following way. You say, you put the first column uh, first, you know, this is just the permutation of 1, 1 to 1, 1, 1, 2 to 2, 2. So you put 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 3, 3, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, etc. You see, there are these nine states. Now you think about this as a state of four particles of three levels each. The levels are written as 1, 2, and 3. It's like a three level atom. And these is, this is a state of these four atoms, which are ha each having three states. And what is cool about this state is that it's a highly entangled state of these four Q tricks they're called now, because there are three states. And it's maximally entangled, or it's absolutely maximally entangled of four particles with three levels each, because you can take any partition of it okay so now maybe the students don't understand but you have four particles you take let's say these two particles it will be maximally entangled with these two you take this particle it will be maximally entangled with the other three you take these two it will be maximally entangled with this you take these two it will be maximally entangled with that so any bipartition of these four particles into two states will be that of a maximally entangled. And these, take it from me, that maximally entangled state, those of you who are not familiar, maximally entangled states are interesting. They are like these bell states, which are used to demonstrate non-locality, teleportation, and so on. So it's kind of fascinating that these kind of orthogonal Latin squares can be used to create these absolutely maximally entangled states very easily. So there is a connection between combinatorics and quantum mechanics. Yeah. So can I say a uh, state is maximally entangled if it can be represented as a combination of the, uh, for example, here we have combination of two elements such that no elements repeats. So can I say that uh, a state can be maximally entangled when they can be represented as a com com like combined products of two? Says that none of them repeats. Can I? Uh, it's a more uh, subtle question, but let me. The question is basically: When can you say that two states are maximally intact, or two particles are maximally intact? And my answer to that is not mathematical. It is that if you have only one particle, you know the least about the entire state. It is maximally entangled. If you have access to only one particle, you know the least, in fact, nothing about the joint state of both the particles. So you need both the particles to tell something about the state of the two particles. See, I said entanglement is something where you know the state of the whole, but you don't know the state of the parts. So if you know the, if you are access only to the parts, you know the least about the whole. In that case, you will call the state maximally entangled. One can go into the mathematics of it, but I clearly don't have the time. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So let's look at this orthogonal Latin squares. Sunil. Okay. Huh? 
Even more? So, no, but we are at an interesting point. So at least I have these nice pictures from Wikipedia. So you think about these orthogonal Latin squares now, forget about quantum mechanics and entanglement. You ask, when can you have orthogonal Latin squares? Okay, one is too trivial. What about two by two? Let me, see. two by two. Are there two by two orthogonal Latin squares? What is a two by two Latin square? There is only one and two as elements. It's a two by two thing as trivial as that. So what, what number should I put here? Two. And here, there is only one more orthogonal Latin square. What is that? This one is two, one, one, two. Are they orthogonal? You put them together, you will get one, one, two, one, two, one, one, two. I don't see one, one, I don't see two, two. So clearly it does not exist, okay? Three, it, it does, I just showed you. Three, it, it exists. And this is an example of that, except that now instead of the num instead of the numbers, they are represented by colors. Okay, there are three colors and there are three chess pieces of different types. So there, no color is repeating, no chess piece type is repeating. Four, it's possible. Five, it's possible. So Euler knew all of these things. He struggled with six and he didn't find any. Okay, so long story short, six, it does not exist. Euler predicted that it doesn't exist for two, it doesn't exist for six. So can you tell me another number that it doesn't exist for? Being a good mathematician like Euler. What's the next number? Two, six, 10, yeah. So he said that nothing exists for two plus four n. No orthogonal Latin squares for two plus four n. This is, he, Especially six, he formulated as Euler's 36 officer problem. 36 officers arranged in a six by six grid so that no, there are of these 36 officers belong to six different regiments and six different ranks. These are the two colors kind of things. No regiment or rank repeats along any column or row. Okay. Uh, so he said this is not possible. And this was proved later in 1900, okay, uh, that in fact it does not exist. And then several proofs were given for this conjecture of Euler. They're all wrong because these two Indians proved that there exists an orthogonal Latin square in 22 dimensions in 1950, 1959, I think. Uh, and uh, then they, along with uh, Parker, in the US, they, they, they showed that, in fact, orthogonal Latin squares exist in all dimensions, except two and six. So for two, it doesn't exist. And uh, therefore, orthogonal Latin squares in two don't exist. And also, there are no absolutely maximally entangled state of four qubits. This was shown by some uh, physicists in uh, around 2000. So clearly, if they existed here, I could have done some trick like what I did here and constructed a four qubit maximum, absolutely maximally entangled state. But this doesn't exist, does not prove that absolutely maximally entangled states do not exist. This was shown by, uh, this was shown uh, 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 by two people. Uh, but what about six? The orthogonal Latin squares were the only way people knew how to construct these absolutely maximally entangled states. So for a long time, this problem was open. What about this? Are there absolutely maximally entangled states of six level atoms, four of them? So this is one of the simplest problems uh, of many, many particle entanglement, and it remained open. What we essentially showed, since I'm running fast out of time, is that there is a unitary matrix, which is 36 dimensional, so 36 by 36 matrix filled with complex numbers, such realignment, the operation which I introduced uh, along with the C naught gate <coughs> is also unitary. And also the partial transpose is unitary. 
So these two operations are also unitary. We showed that such a thing exists, explicitly constructing it. And the entries of that quite interestingly depended only on the golden mean, which we all know from Fibonacci and so on, uh, and these roots of unity. So complex numbers come in essential here. It's not a real matrix, it's a complex matrix. And why are these two real, realignment and gamma essential? It looks like I have kind of done something very fast going, via, going to orthogonal Latin squares and then these R and gamma, I have not connected them very well. Let me just do that in one sentence here by saying that if you look at what is special about an orthogonal Latin square, if I say that I'm going to give you the first column, I'm sorry, the first row and the entry, the first entry is two, then it fixes this number as two, two. See? That is enough information. See, if I give you this, uh, and if I say entry in cell one, two, that gives you uniquely two, two. But if I instead tell you that the first row is taken and the first element is given, that also fixes uniquely. That is out of these four numbers, any two of them maps bijectively to the other. This is the case. And, uh, and this is, this is the property that gives it the fact that it's an absolutely maximally entangled state. And therefore, we have, in a sense, found some quantum version of these orthogonal Latin squares. So in fact, there is a lot of work about quantum orthogonal Latin squares, which are now being uh, studied as generalizations of these kind of Latin squares, where the Euler's, Euler problem, you can think about the officers as being entangled or something. So this work was published in this paper. As I said, this is a joint work with Suhail and, uh, and so on. You can also read general, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, write-ups for a more general audience. So this is a uh, write-up in Quanta magazine, uh, Euler's 243-year-old impossible puzzle gets a quantum solution. So there are several write-ups about this. And there was also an award given to the students for solving this. So uh, we, we, have we have gone on and shown that there are infinity of these solutions and they are all very different from each other. This is what involved uh, also the mathematician from IMSC. Um, and I believe this was just accepted today. So uh, in, in a publication, I haven't gone into the many particle. Uh, I started out by saying many particle physics what is interesting about these dual unitary operators is that you can put them all together. You can put them all together in circuits like these and be able to solve them in a sense of finding correlation functions, which you can't find otherwise easily. So this is now a many particle system with many, many dual unitaries, and we can find these correlation functions exactly in time. Thanks to this unitarity property, you, you, these kind of things reduce, these circuits reduce to these. And further, because of dual unitarity, they reduce even further. And I'll just tell you the result that these correlations survive only along one line on this. So what it effectively means, again, to just give you a picture other than the mathematics, is that these dual unitary operators when you put them together into a circuit, creates a lot of scrambling and entanglement so that uh, the operators, localized operators, they spread out very fast and they get scrambled. And this you can control analytically and study the rate at which they are uh, scrambling and so on. So this was in fact work with uh, Professor Arvinda and Suhail for details about that, you can see a rather elaborate paper. So let me summarize. Um, actually, the summary doesn't correspond much to what, what I was saying, but these two unitary operators are these multi-unitaries, which I talked about. It's possible to construct many particle states out of these, or many particle states which are absolutely maximally entangled, that I've already said. This part of the talk, I haven't been able to go through in more detail, but they construct these things which we call Bernoulli circuits as they are very uh, 
they are at the apex of an ergodic hierarchy. They are as chaotic as they can be. Another word which I have not used so far, which I usually use in my talks is chaos. So this one is as chaotic as it can be from a quantum mechanical sense. Uh, okay, there are a lot of interesting things to be studied, a lot of open problems. For instance, the generalization of these kind of uh, Latin squares, uh, there's only two, I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, four particles uh, or two Latin squares, but you can generalize it to many particles. Uh, like for instance, each entry has three entries rather than uh, just two has implications for quantum physics they are poorly understood and uh, uh, and finite quantum circuits built out of them are uh, very challenging so we are studying now things like these correlation functions long time averages connections to what are called partial spectral form factors and also Recently, we studied what are classical equivalents of these dual unitary operators. All this is quantum. What about classical mechanics? Are there no dual unitary operators? I said that a unitary operator is like a canonical transformation. So we found that there were canonical transformation, classical canonical transformation, which have these properties like dual properties. And then they lead to very interesting many body classical systems, which we build up. So they are interesting to study these things. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And sorry, really sorry to go over time. You'll excuse me for that. <laughs> yeah, questions? Hi. Uh, I would like to ask if there is any uh, systematic approach to create dual unitaries and un uh, two unitaries? Systematic approach for dual unitaries and two unitaries. May I know your background just so that I can tailor my answer for that? Yeah, I, I am actually uh, one project in this topic, dual unitary. Okay, very so, good. Uh, You're doing a project. So uh, the for qubits, it's known. Yes. Dual unitaries are known. There are no two, two unitaries. So answer is simple. Uh, and the other simple answer is actually there are many classes of unitary constructions of dual unitary operators. With Aravinda and Suhail, we have a algorithm to produce numerically these things. So we can do that, but to find numerically multi unitaries are difficult, but dual unitaries we can. But analytically, there are classes which are known. But it's not comprehensive at all. That's an open problem. I didn't go even into the uh, two cutrid case where there are very interesting open problems. Construction of dual unitary operators is a challenge. So these orthogonal Latin squares, you can construct some dual unitary operators from such combinatorial objects. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have defined some relaxations on the. Uh, so there's some combinatorial objects you can. Uh, you can define. But in general, no, there is no parameterization of dual unitary operators and multi unitary. It's a challenge. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, sir, how can we quantum computing? Uh, how can what? Okay. Start studying quantum computing. Study quantum mechanics first. No, I'm not being facetious. You have to study some quantum mechanics, and but you don't need to, you know, go into quantum mechanics one and two and so on. You can have a fast uh, start to quantum mechanics. For example, quantum computing, especially if you're interested in computing, I would say that uh, start with just two qubit uh, or single qubit gates like these kind of things which I talked about. Implement them. There's a nice this quiz kit learn how it is just if you know python is just uh, one step away and start playing around with that i think that would be a nice way of uh, learning especially now that kind of opportunity is there for you yeah hi uh, so uh, what exactly this operator uh, entanglement uh, does because 
as you said that this swap uh, is essentially it's not generating any entanglement right so what physically it, it does like this measure this operator entanglement thanks uh, so operator entanglement and entangling power entangling power you don't have a question about or do you there is entangling power and there is operator entanglement there are two different things um it gives me an opportunity to go to things which i skipped yeah so this is operator entanglement you just do a operator schmidt decomposition of this unitary operator and uh, you find this is the lambda so this is actually just a linear entropy of this uh, schmidt coefficient okay now as to your question about what is it exactly is a operational me question so if you have two uh, particles uh, i mean if you have a unitary operator connecting let's say a and b the operator entanglement of this doesn't have a direct meaning as if you just take these two but if you take ancillas a prime and b prime as ancilla particles and you have these in a maximally entangled state initial state is maximally entangled then it defines a four particle state every unitary defines a four particle state that is actually the connection which i again did not this one a two particle unitary defines a four particle state such like so a operator entanglement will tell you this is actually the state that state is nothing but this u a b uh, a prime b prime is identity acting on phi plus a a prime maximally entangled this is actually the same as that now e of u the operator entanglement of this is the entanglement of this with this i see after this so and uh, okay i see. so that's the reason why i mean you can have a completely product state but the swap can be like exactly and another question which i also i asked arvind at some point so all these dual unitary and all these things can i have an effective hamiltonian which can give me this kind of dual unitary technically yes because probably i can take the log and uh, get some hamiltonian but can i have a meaningful hamiltonian like which good question so one of the first systems for which there was a dual unitary was successful particle time duality was done actually by i didn't mention names of people here but thomas gur's group uh, gutkin gore and akila and so on they were dealing with the icing model just the transverse field actually uh, also with a longitudinal field so floquet icing model is an example of a dual unitary except that there's no hamiltonian there it's a floquet it's model a floquet. so floquet model so the floquet unitary is essentially in that model is ah, yeah. icing icing there is a bit of a catch but i see i see a little bit of a catch but actually the icing model with the longitudinal field can be solved using okay. for particular values of the parameter I as the dual point right where it is not integrable yeah where it's not integrable but again is related to the other question whether there are systematic ways of sure yeah so we don't know the hamiltonians which are yeah sure okay. but the same question brings me to the other this question for example you went from a uh, quantum to classical right Yeah. I mean, so getting the dual unitary is for canonical transformation. Yeah. Can I go back once I have the canonical transformation in the classical thing, and then uh, I do the canonical quantization? Yeah. Uh, and then get the Hamiltonian like that. There also it's Floquet. So whatever I have done so far, huh. they are Floquet Hamiltonians. Yes, you can. Okay. Because the uh, maybe I should say that the dual, the gamma dual or the T dual, they are very easy to construct. okay easy to construct meaning actually a whole host of physical problems 
are essentially gamma dual or T dual. Swap is what makes it uh, dual. So swap is something which, if you are willing to live with swap, then it's actually you can uh, you can do this. Yeah, yeah, it's going to permute two uh, things. So swap is a critical ingredient for a dual unitary. So gamma dual is somewhat more related to what we are usually dealing with. So swap multiplied by that you can, yeah. Can we? Or... It's it's a uh, it's a can I ask? Yeah, um, sir. Uh, we have taught in uh, the previous semester, like uh, if you want to in like inverse a matrix, so it should be a square matrix and it's determinant. So no, uh, um, no, no, determinant should, should not be zero. Sorry, sorry, sorry I'm sorry, sorry. determinant yeah. should not be zero, and it should be a square matrix. But in physics, uh, we sometimes use matrices which are not square, but although we can inverse it. So how can we just uh, inverse something in mathematics? Uh, in uh, like in vector algebra, uh, sorry, in uh, yeah, yeah, in linear algebra, and how it is not applicable in physics. Like, uh, can I explain? Like, no, you're talking about some linear algebra problem, but I I would say that look at you know there's something called the Penrose uh, inverse. What is it? Penrose. So there's something called singular value decomposition, which plays an important role in that. This is a linear algebra question. Out of my depth, but you can. Okay. Yes, sorry, we have. Yeah, so uh, the understanding I get is the swap operator is very important. Yes. And if we are talking about a real system of qubits, say an ionic system or an atomic system, so how can one actually construct this kind of an operator? Why not? I said that at the beginning, just three C naught gives you a swap. Yeah, so what is the implementation? And like, how am I implementing if this? If you C implement naught? a C naught, yeah, in a real system, say in an actual, so COVID this system. is what everybody does. So, I mean, in the sense that if you are, if you start out by saying, I'm going to do computing, first thing you do is implement a C naught. Okay. Don't ask me how to, but okay. I'm saying that this is a very uh, a standard thing to implement C. So, C naught, by the way, yeah, maybe I can, I can say a bit more. C naught is not that hard to, for example, uh, C naught is equivalent to even the icing Hamiltonian. So just, just sticking to qubits, huh? yeah, yeah. qubits and above are slightly more. Yeah. E to the power of I pi by four, sigma X tends to sigma. This is, if you can implement this, you have implemented C naught. Okay. So I think this is something well within the reach of sort of. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, can I request you thank you? Uh, so, uh, I request uh, Dr. Sunil for a thank you. Yeah, I think there may be a more questions so this which can be also uh, asked outside after this. Okay, so I think now we need to conclude this talk. It's already like uh, our time. I think we may also have classes, I don't know, maybe all, all left. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Arul Lakshminar uh, for accepting our offer to come and talk. I, I had told um, my student, like a second year, one of his students to attend this. Now, I don't know whether it was a good thing or no bad thing, <laughs> they will say. <laughs> but it was, it's a really kind of you, sir, uh, to explain to them some of the basic things which they have to know to understand this. Uh, I think it will be very... Uh, useful for them to appreciate how how to approach quantum physics and whatever they are learning now is probably not really quantum mechanics yet. Yeah, so probably you need now know what is the difference between quantum physics and quantum mechanics. Anyway, uh, so um, and I think now I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Deshmukh to say some words and well, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Arul, for a very, very fascinating talk. Um, I, I must apologize for uh, intervening and uh, preventing some of the questions which were going. You know, they were very interesting questions, uh, questions which continue to trouble. No, but Pranava, but for that, it would have gone. I, I would have had to cancel my train. So. Yeah, I, I thought so as well. <laughs> 
so I would I would like to suggest to these students that uh, it is good that they ask these questions. I appreciate these questions, and uh, they can they can. I'm sure our role will not mind uh, replying to an email or two. But uh, more locally, they they can get help from people like Sunil uh, Sambodha is there, Vinay, Ritesh, uh, Arvinda, of course. So, so I think uh, it it is good that they have these questions, and these are these were good questions, uh, which have troubled all of us uh, when we studied quantum mechanics. So, so I think these were excellent questions. Uh, so please uh, persist with your query. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have time to address all the questions, but this was a very fascinating talk and very proud that uh, Arul and his collaborators, and we have Arvinda over here, they have made an extremely important contribution to this field. Uh, so very proud of your work, Arul. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Pranav. This is all, yes. you know, you know wonderful. Or means uh, it. It. Uh, I. I'm sure that you know some of some of the people in the audience uh, will be able to get reports on the internet very easily and uh, discover for him for themselves uh, that you know getting a solution to a 250 year old problem, um, which was considered to be unsolvable, and how quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement enables you to obtain a solution is really amazing. So wonderful piece of work. Thank you very much for this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. It's, uh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I think and I should pleasure. also say sorry to you because uh, you could not really go over the way you have planned your no, talk. No, Sunil, actually, if, if anybody has to apologize, <laughs> it has to be me because so many experts here and uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, I did yeah, not. It is difficult to thanks for everyone. There are a mix of everyone, like experts and also students who are just learning quantum physics so because of that yeah it was not the way it was planned I think. but uh, thank you very much for thanks. taking us through that the basic things and uh, helpful for students yeah thanks. thank you okay.